Our moderator tonight is our Cap Times opinion editor, Jessie O'Poyan, who until a few months ago covered politics for us. She did an excellent job for five or six years. Jessie grew up in Marinette, Wisconsin, was editor of the Iowa State Daily when she attended college, and has won multiple regional journalism awards. Jessie hosts our political podcast titled Wedge Issues. Welcome, Jessie. And now our keynote speaker. As you know, Tom Perez is at the epicenter of one of the most dynamic and closely watched presidential primary selection processes in modern history. As chairman of the Democratic National Committee since 2017, he comes tonight directly from Houston via Chicago, we were tracking his flights, uh, where 10 uh, Democratic candidates, of course, debated last night. Chairman Perez was born and raised in Buffalo, New York, and is the Spanish-speaking son of Dominican immigrants. His father died of a heart attack when Tom was 12, which moved him, he has told interviewers, to live with a purpose, hence his devotion to public service. He has degrees from Brown, Harvard Law School, and the JFK School of Government at Harvard. While at Brown, I thought it interesting that he helped cover his costs, both collecting trash and by working at the Rhode Island Commission for Human Rights. He had a distinguished career in public service, mostly in Maryland, and taught law at the University of Maryland and George Washington University. He headed the Office of Civil Rights in the Justice Department before President Obama elevated him to serve as Secretary of Labor in Obama's second term. He also has Badger connections. His wife is a Wisconsin native and a UW-Madison graduate. His father-in-law lives in Wauwatosa, and the Perez's youngest daughter is a senior here at UW-Madison, and he told me she's out of town this weekend. So, <laughs> um, In preparing this introduction, I came across something his parents told him as a child that really struck me, and I quote, in order to get to heaven, you have to have letters of reference from poor people. Please welcome Tom Perez and Jesse O'Poyan. You'll have to forgive our late entrance. We were uh, actually just talking about our shared Marinette County connections. <laughs> um, so uh, just first of all, thank you, Chairman Perez, for, for being Tom, here. It's a lot Tom, quicker. Tom, I, I can call you Tom. I can do Please. that. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so proof that Wisconsin is the center of the universe. Uh, it turns out that uh, many of you probably know that, that Tom Perez has a lot of Wisconsin connections, but what you might not know is that I grew up next door to Tom Perez's wife's grandmother. <laughs> she literally just gave me a photo of when she was like, uh, like 15 years ten. old oh, no, or 10 kid. years old. <laughs> it was 10 years ago. And uh, it, with my wife's grandmother who died 20, 25 years ago. Amazing Unbelievable. Woman. Yeah. Um, so Wisconsin is, is important to both of us, to you. Great to be here. <laughs> good, good to have you back. Um, tell us a little bit about your relationship with the state, besides our shared Marinette County connections. Well, uh, I got married in Milwaukee uh, 31 years ago and change. Uh, my wife is the oldest of six, five of whom went here to uh, Madison. Uh, we have three kids. Our middle kid is a senior here at Madison. And uh, as luck would have it, she's actually up at, in Marinette County this weekend. <laughs> at her grandfather's, uh, my father-in-law's cabin on the lake, enjoying a nice Indian summer weekend. Uh, so I've, I've had a lot of roots here in Wisconsin and it was an honor. Uh, and frankly, I, uh, my work in the Civil Rights Division brought me here from time to time. We had some work in New Berlin. Uh, I remember in the housing context because uh, while I love Wisconsin, I am not, um, uh, oblivious to many of the challenges. Uh, Wisconsin, or the Greater Milwaukee and Detroit have been for, frankly, a couple decades now in a pitch battle to see who is the most segregated census track, uh, MSA in the country. And from that challenge results a fair amount of business for civil rights lawyers, uh, including in New Berlin, including some work we did in the Milwaukee uh, school district, uh, because uh, there's some great schools in the city of Milwaukee, but there's still some challenges there, as you're well aware. 
Uh, but uh, it's great to be here now and in my current position, we're doing quite a bit and we're, uh, we got 418 days until the most important election of our lifetime, who's counting? I know I am and I know there's one other person in the room counting and his name is Ben Wickler and he's right over there because he's your state party chair and you should know that he is one of the best state party chairs in the United States. That is a fact, folks. Um, and Ben, before that, was the executive director at MoveOn.org. He knows his stuff. As we say in the business, he's got game, and he's been a great partner. And so I, while I come to you tonight with sobriety, born out of the fact that you know, we're at this moral fork in the road with the most dangerous president, I think, in American history, I come to you with unrelenting optimism because um, you know, on the darkest nights, you do see the brightest stars emerge. And all over this country, I've seen the brightest stars emerge and uh, the work that was done 2017, 2018 uh, to rebuild our democracy, rebuild trust. Uh, I look forward to talking about it. Speaking of dark nights for you, not to start on a downer of a note, but um, what, what were the first things that went through your mind? What did you say when you found out that Wisconsin had elected a Republican for president for the first time? In more than 30 years in 2016. Well, my daughter, who's here at Madison, uh, turned 18 on November 9th, 2016. I, I know what you're thinking. We should have induced a day earlier. <laughs> I, I hadn't thought of that at the time, but I felt badly. Uh, she was actively involved in the Wisconsin Dems. Uh, she's your quintessential middle child, a little bit quieter, but the wheels are always spinning. And uh, it was an awakening for her, uh, working on that race. And I recall vividly, the smartest thing I did was I didn't go to New York uh, for the uh, celebration, uh, because uh, I had been to 22 states on behalf of Secretary Clinton, and it was an honor to do that. And I promised my youngest, who was in high school, who I had to abandon for the run-up to that election, that I would watch the returns with him in the basement of our house. Smartest thing I ever did with hindsight. Uh, so I could wallow <laughs> in the privacy of my own home. Uh, but we had two choices at that point, you know? And, and when, the, the interesting thing about Wisconsin, to get at your question, and this is, this is really important to understand, Mitt Romney got more votes in 2012 in Wisconsin than uh, uh, this current president got in 2016. And, uh, and, and there were two categories of challenge. There were Obama, Obama stay-at-home voters. They tended to be younger and more diverse. And then there were Obama, Obama, Jill Stein voters. And if we just kept the Obama, Obama, Jill Stein voters, that would have been enough. I think the margin was roughly 22,000 and change. If we had just kept the, uh, the Obama, Obama stay at home, if they had voted, uh, we would have won Wisconsin as well. I could tell the same story, by the way, in Michigan, where the margin was actually under 11,000. And so I recall reading about a week later a story that broke my heart uh, in a, it was, I think it was in the New York Times, and it focused on four or five African-American voters in the city of Milwaukee, uh, all of whom either didn't vote or they voted for Jill Stein. And it was the quintessential Tip O'Neill story. It was the story of uh, nobody asked, no one showed up, politics is way too transactional, what have you done for me? Who, wh wh what tangibly can you tell me that you are going to do? And I remember, just to fast forward a little bit, uh, Jesse, when I, I remember when I was first in this job, uh, I did two outreach events uh, that I remember like they were yesterday. One was in Detroit, where I went, I was at an AME church, and I asked, you know, folks, you know, what, what do we have to do better? Because you have to do a lot of listening when you're trying to dig out. And this one woman said to me, you gotta stop showing up at my church every 4th October pretending that you care. And she was spot on. And uh, because it was true. And, uh, and then I had another trip with one of your state senators in the northwest corner of the state, Senator Bewley. And we were expecting 75 people at this event, and there were probably 175 people who showed up, including a physician who drove three hours from Appleton, I think. 
And he said to me, and I quote, uh, I feel politically homeless because y'all abandoned us after Dave Obie left. And I remember that well. And the most important thing we had to do when I began this job is we had to reorient our mission. Our mission is to elect Democrats from the school board to the Oval Office and to do so everywhere. And we have to organize everywhere in order to do that. You have to organize everywhere and every year because we stop doing that. When politics becomes transactional and you become a, a party whose mission is to elect the president every fourth year, you end up with a 10-month innovation cycle every fourth year. Now, I'm sure there are many successful business, nonprofit, academics, or you, you don't have a business if you, hey, hey, let's wake up, it's the fourth year, we're gonna innovate for a few months. And that's kind of what happened. And so our technology infrastructure frayed. Our organizing infrastructure was virtually non-existent. Uh, and meanwhile, the other side, post-2012, they studied what we did and they beat us at our own game. So this was tragic because it was so preventable. And the question presented should never be, uh, how did you lose the presidential? The question should be, how did you lose elections at scale up and down the ballot over a series of years? That's the question I've been focusing on. And what I'm most proud of right now is we're building, again, a 50-state party. Uh, organizing early, organizing everywhere. 2017, you know, we, we had great victories. Uh, New Jersey and Virginia taught us we could win again. A month later, Alabama taught us we could win everywhere. And frankly, I was um, investing in Alabama, number one, because I'd known Doug Jones. We worked together in the Clinton administration doing civil rights work. Number two, I said we were gonna be a 50-state party again. And number three, I wanted to send a very clear message to African-American voters, a backbone of the Democratic Party, that we would never take them for granted again. And people said, Tom, you can't win there. You know, you don't have a ton of money. This is a fool's errand. I disagree. And you know what? We got three governor's races this year in the South, Kentucky, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And you know what they all have in common right now? The Democrat is ahead in the polling. The Democrat has a shot to win. And we've been organizing in all three of those places. And we organized last year for Mike Espy, a Senate candidate in Mississippi, who didn't quite make it to the mountaintop. We would love to have had him make it to the mountaintop, but the point was to build a 12-month-a-year infrastructure, to not be deterred when you lose once, but to continue to move forward pursuant to a real plan to organize, organize early, organize everywhere, and organize with your partners. And that's why I come to you with optimism, because we're in a much better place than we were two and a half years ago. So when you came into the, the DNC chairmanship, you talked about this being a rebuilding uh, role for you. Um, what did you have to take stock of to rebuild, sure. and what are you still working on? There's two dimensions to the rebuilding. There's rebuilding our infrastructure, and then there's rebuilding trust. Uh, we needed to do both. And, and, and the whole process of rebuilding trust, I think, is a timeless journey. Uh, we had the Unity Reform Commission, which was uh, a group of folks, some of whom supported Secretary Clinton, some of whom supported uh, Senator Sanders, some of whom uh, supported others. And we came together around a series of reforms on the trust front, including reforms of superdelegate laws. Uh, rules that the DNC had. Our goal was to return power to the grassroots. Our goal was to earn trust by making sure that uh, people understood that we're fighting for everyday Americans. Our goal was to make sure that uh, we put in place measures that would enhance participation. So actually, one thing we did that you're gonna see in this cycle, we incentivized more participation by incentivizing states to uh, actually moved from caucuses to primaries. And actually six states that were caucus states six years, uh, four years ago are now primary states. And those states that are caucus states still have taken measures to make sure that we can uh, participate, that the voters can participate even more. And the reason why I think that's important is because it's pretty clear. When you have a primary, more people participate. And I want more people to participate. So, so that's some of the work we're doing on the trust front. We had to rebuild our infrastructure. Our technology infrastructure was antiquated. That's the most polite word I can use to describe it. And we, uh, 
our, our system, our, our data and technology infrastructure was built in 2011. It was designed to last two or three years. It was still there in 2017. It was the equivalent of my asking you to you know, pull out your Palm Pilots. Uh, except what you have to understand is 8,000 people were running for office last year using our voter file. So when, you're, when you've got a rickety thing like that, you've got a, a real problem. And so we had to, uh, first of all, we had to recruit and attract good people. Um, this is like my third or fourth job in a row that I would describe as a fixer-upper. Um, and one of the things that I've learned in fixer-uppers is that the most important thing you got to do is bring in the right people. And we were able to recruit some top flight talent. I wanted to become a destination employer. One example, our chief technology officer we brought in, he was the 40th employee or so at Twitter. And he literally built their, uh, he was the chief engineer who designed Twitter. And maybe you want to yell at him now. <laughs> but uh, that, that's <laughs> another thing. Um, and so we were able to recruit talent like that. So that today's technology infrastructure is night and day different. Uh, and then we had to rebuild our organizing infrastructure. And we also had to make sure we were helping to rebuild state parties. Because when I say that our mission is to elect Democrats up and down the ticket, we do so by building strong parties everywhere and building strong partnerships everywhere. Partnerships with legacy organizations, the labor movement, Planned Parenthood. Partnerships with emerging organizations, the indivisible chapters, uh, swing left, etc. And so our goal was to become not Al Haig, but to become a tentpole in a broader ecosystem. And so we've spent a lot of time building our voter protection infrastructure, building our organizing infrastructure, building our technology infrastructure, and in so doing, working together with our state party partners so that everybody's upping their game at the same time. Something you said about, about Jill Stein has uh, stood out to me. I've heard you say it before. And I think uh, in, in punditry, I think we hear a lot about talking about recapturing uh, Trump voters who maybe are disillusioned and may swing back. Or we hear a lot about recapturing people who have voted for Democrats before but who didn't show up in 2016. I don't hear as much about recapturing those Jill Stein voters. Um, and these are very different kind of demographics and, and different kinds of, of voters to go after. Does the Democratic Party need to be focusing on the Jill Stein voters, on the center, recapturing the center? Is it an all of the above game? And how do you make all of those different appeals? Well, it is all of the above and then some. If, if you want to win the presidency, you've got to do two things. If you want to win elections, let, let's, let's uh, extrapolate. Uh, you've got to do two things. You have to have uh, a mobilized and excited base, and you have to win moderate voters. You know, if, if you look at the data, uh, and this is all self-reported data, uh, the largest, there's three blocks of voters. The largest block of voters are self-identified moderates. The second largest block is self-identified uh, conservatives. And the third largest block, growing, is self-identified liberals. So you do the math on this. Uh, you have to have a mobilized base and you have to win moderate voters. And by the way, you have to win moderate voters by quite a bit. If you look at the 2018 cycle and you compare it with the 2014 cycle and the 2010 cycle, and you look at how we did with moderate voters, that explains a lot of how we won in 2018, and that explains a lot of how we lost in 2014 and 2010. And in 2018, we had a really engaged base. Uh, we were able to expand the denominator. Young people turned out 50% more than in 2014. Uh, my favorite organizers that I worked with in the 2018 cycle were Dreamers in Nevada. Uh, Dr Dreamers are great people to do voter registration because they walk up to you and they say, you have a right that I covet. Like, why the hell aren't you registered to vote? Except they don't say, why the hell? Because <laughs> they're too polite. But... Uh, we, we had great candidates like Tony Evers who are authentic. I mean, Tony Evers is the antithesis of Scott Walker. He's authentic. He had message discipline. He talked about two things, health care and education. And I was with two recently elected state legislative uh, folks in Texas over the last couple of days because I just flew here from Houston. And they flipped these two seats in the suburban Houston area that had been Republican forever. 
And how did you do it? We organized, we knocked on 10,000 doors, and we talked about the issues that matter most. What were the issues? Healthcare and education. And that message discipline, we had a mobilized base. We had great candidates who fit their states. We made unprecedented investments in these midterm elections. And we had an unprecedented level of collaboration. All too frequently, I think Democrats bowled alone. And in this cycle, uh, we had our oars in the water and we were rowing in synchrony. And that, to me, I think was a real key to success. And we've got to sustain it. And one thing that Ben has done here in Wisconsin, and we've been a proud partner uh, with Ben, we invested roughly a million dollars in the 2018 cycle. We invested money in Rebecca Dallet's race. Um, and uh, let me tell you a story about that race that you might not know. Um, when I talked about voter uh, protection infrastructure in passing, we did some work with a number of the uh, counties that uh, allowed our team to learn a little bit about how elections work. Apparently you have like two sets of books here um, of voters. It sounds nefarious. There's, there's a, there was a registry of folks who are registered, eligible to vote, and have in fact voted. And there was a registry of folks who are eligible to vote but haven't voted. And it was really important to make sure that every uh, precinct had both books there. Why? Because we were doing a lot of organizing of sporadic voters. And the worst thing in the world you can do is persuade a sporadic voter to show up, and then they show up and they're told they're not on the rolls and they gotta cast a provisional vote. That's the kiss of death. That's why when I talk about infrastructure, you gotta do everything. And that's exactly what we've done. And, and in this cycle, just to give you an example of what has been done under Ben's leadership in Wisconsin, in 2019, 2019, they've, they've knocked on 200,000 doors in the state of Wisconsin. Four years ago, I am prepared to argue it was probably closer to zero because we had the old model. You know, every fourth year we engage. That's not the way it is anymore. We have an initiative called Organizing Corps. A thousand organizers that we're hiring, training, and deploying to whoever the nominee is. And I'll, I'm going to pull out my button in a little while. It, it'll tell you who I'm voting for. It says Democrat for president. <laughs> okay? And, uh, you know, in Organizing Corps, we, we've, our first cohort of 300 started in May. And it's in... Uh, uh, seven different battleground states, including Wisconsin. And this summer, they knocked on 20,000 doors here in Wisconsin. So roughly, um, you know, I, I, uh, roughly a tenth of the doors that have been knocked uh, by Ben and his team have been knocked by these organizing core kids, and 77% and of whom are kids of color, 95% of whom are homegrown. So our, our org core kids in Wisconsin were of Wisconsin. And so these are the things we're doing. There's no rocket science involved in this. A lot of it is shoe leather, and a lot of it is persistence. And that's why I'm bullish about what we can do here. So after 2016, I think we had a lot of punchlines about Hillary Clinton not returning to Wisconsin after the presidential primary, which Bernie Sanders won. Do you think that mattered? I think... Uh, there are a lot of things that happen. Um, I, I often liken um, an election, uh, a, an election is like the human body, or a, a campaign is like the human body. The human body has two kidneys. Uh, there's, a, there's the data kidney, and then there's the eyeballs organizing kidney, okay? So and, the eyeballs are uh, in the kidney? And you can live with one kidney, okay? Uh, my mother had one kidney for a good part of her life, and she was able to live uh, a, a, a good quality of life. But the problem with one kidney is if it fails, it can be catastrophic. And the challenge that we had in Wisconsin and elsewhere is that because of the underinvestment in the organizing side, and you remember that story I told you that was in the New York Times, and that was unfortunately not, uh, I could have told that story in Wayne County, uh, Michigan. I could have told that story up, you know, in the northwest corner of Wisconsin. And 
as a result of the fact that we didn't have a sufficiently robust organizing infrastructure here, when your data kidney is malfunctioning, and, and what we learned about data analytics from the 2016 loss in the presidential is it does not predict late-breaking events. So the Comey memo was a, a, a spectacular buzzkill. And I, I figured I'm, I'm on a Madison campus. <laughs> you know, I asked somebody, I was asking someone, what's going to be the age demographic of people who are coming? Because on a Friday night, I know what I did in college, and it wasn't go listen to some guy talking about politics. <laughs> but I digress. Um, and, and so, I mean, that was the challenge. If you don't have... If you don't have both, sometimes you can survive, but if you have a malfunction like that, you're in big trouble. So we're building both kidneys to have real muscle mass so that they can be the robust operation we need. And, and that was a, that's a, the organizing core is another example of that, um, Jesse, because we want people talking to voters now. And I met with the org core kids when I was out in Milwaukee, and I asked them, what are you learning? And they said, some voters are confused. They're used to us coming a week before the election. They were wondering if there was an election next week. And I said, this is culture change. And you know what we did? The, and this is, you know, this is part of Ben's philosophy. Good leaders are good listeners. We're not going asking them to vote for someone right now. We're going to say, what is on your mind? What should we be fighting for? And that's what politics should be. All politics is personal. All politics is relational. And those 200,000 door knocks and counting here in Wisconsin are going to pay real dividends. And, and so if it isn't obvious to you, we're coming to Milwaukee next summer. We're here a lot. We've knocked on 200,000 doors. We just gave them more money to hire a rural coordinator. We gave money before to hire a Latino outreach person because we got 60,000 eligible, unregistered, likely Democratic Latino voters right here in Wisconsin. So we have to do all of this and above. And when we do that, that's how we succeed. Great choice, obviously. I think we all agree. Uh, this is a good thing for Wisconsin to have the convention here. Interestingly, traditionally, historically, having the convention in the state doesn't necessarily guarantee a win in the state for the party who has a convention there. It's kind of a toss-up, kind of goes whichever way history has tended to go for that particular party. So what are the advantages sure. of doing this here? Well, I, I, you're, you're empirically correct, Jesse. Uh, <laughs> I think we were in Philadelphia four years ago, if my memory serves me. And we all know how that happened, uh, uh, how that turned out. Uh, th the choice of a city doesn't guarantee success in that state. There's no doubt about it. But the choice of the city is an opportunity to send a really strong message. And we had, a, we had an embarrassment of riches. Miami, Houston were great cities who put forth great presentations. For me, every decision I make in this job is motivated by one thing. How can we win? And in the end, I chose Milwaukee because I believe it gives us the best chance of winning. Why? Because while the choice of the city doesn't guarantee success, you can use the choice of the city to send a very clear signal of what your values are, and you can use the choice of a city as an organizing tool. And Ben and I have had this conversation relentlessly. We are doing things that we have never done before around a convention. And it's not simply organizing in Milwaukee. It's organizing in Wisconsin. It's organizing in Michigan. It's organizing in Minnesota. It's organizing in Ohio and Pennsylvania. Because I firmly believe that while we have multiple pathways to 270, the most linear pathway to 270 is to replicate in 2020 what we did in 2018, which is to say we ran the table in all the statewides here. We ran the table in all the statewides in Michigan. We ran the table in all the statewides in Pennsylvania. To put it differently, we learned the lessons of our shortcomings from the 2016 cycle. We internalized that. We, we implemented that. And we were able to win at scale in all of these states. And we do that again. It's game, set, and match for this president. It's not the only thing we're doing. But the choice of Milwaukee enables us, I think, to really put our best foot forward. And we're doing a lot of regional organizing, talking from Minnesota to Iowa to Wisconsin, all the way through to Pennsylvania, talking about how we can use this opportunity, uh, talking about how we can 
uh, take the volunteers that are coming in and in a legal way, after they're done with the convention, putting them to work in Wisconsin uh, so that we continue that momentum. We are engaging the community because I don't want them just to think that this was a party and somebody came in and had a party for five days in their city. We're engaging the community like never before, not just the community of Milwaukee, but the community around the state. And that's when, and elections are won and lost at the margins, 22,000 votes here. And so I think this is something that is gonna enable us to get a leg up. Your convention CEO wrote an op-ed recently, we published it in the Cap Times, and he talked a little bit about um, what that infrastructure might look like beyond the convention itself, and he used that as sort of a selling point of this doesn't end at the convention, this doesn't end in July of next year. So what can the DNC do to be more active um, based on that groundwork that you'll lay with the convention? Well, I'll, I'll take a step back, Jesse. We started laying groundwork in 2017 and working with um, Ben's predecessor, Martha Lanning, who also I, I want to say uh, a, a big thank you to. And you know, what happened in 2017 is you had like 15 people running for governor, uh, may have been more. Uh, and, and what happens is usually uh, you do what's called the coordinated campaign. That's when everybody gets together and, and uh, you know, puts their resources together. And that's usually not done until after the primary. The problem with that in Wisconsin is your primary was in August of 2018. And if you waited until then to start organizing, you had squandered a year. I can't get yesterday back, but I have tomorrow. And so we actually started organizing in 2017 in Wisconsin. And we invested in a number of special elections here. You had a special election in, uh, I think it was in the Ron Kynes district. Um, uh, it was a coroner, I think, who... Uh, Patty Schachner. Yeah. Yep. And yeah, we invested in, in that race. Because again, we understood you gotta organize everywhere. And those early investments really paid dividends. And so we're building off of this as we go into the 2019 cycle. Uh, one of the other things we've done now in 2019, and again, all of this is in lockstep with Ben and the party. We're all in this together. Uh, we have an initiative called the DNC War Room. And so we have a communications person that we've funded that is actually with the Wisconsin Democratic Party. The purpose of the war room is to localize the impact of this president. Uh, this president is a walking, lying machine. And the trail of broken promises and lies runs far and deep. And so the purpose of this uh, war room, and it's a joint venture of our party partners, us, our research team, our comms team, we go into states, and, and we did an event uh, six weeks ago or so, uh, with uh, dairy farmers. It was about a week or so after Trump had come here. And he said when he was here, and I quote, farmers are over the hump. That's what he said. Well, folks, as you well know, uh, farmers are over the barrel. Uh, Wisconsin is the farm bankruptcy capital of the United States. There were 2,700 farm bankruptcies in 2018. A third of them were in Wisconsin. And this president had the audacity to come here and tell everyone that things are fine. And so what we do at the War Room is we hold public events. We, we uh, amplify what the reality is. And we start out with the promise of Trump. In this case, farmers are over the hump. And then through the lens of real farmers here, you know, I'm the fifth generation dairy farmer and there isn't gonna be a sixth generation. By the way, we don't simply have a farm crisis here. We have an emerging suicide crisis in Wisconsin and elsewhere. And to have the audacity to say everything's okay. And by the way, you know why? I mean, farmers had headwinds. Dairy farmers especially had some real economic headwinds. But what the straw that broke the camel's back was, was tariffs. I mean, that's, that's abundantly clear. So our comms in bed here, who is spectacular, is spending every day amplifying that and other things. We have uh, footage of people with pre-existing conditions who are, you know, that, if you don't have healthcare security, you don't have economic security. If you don't have healthcare security, you can't sleep at night. And so again, we highlight the promise and then we highlight the reality. We go into Ohio, into, into the Lordstown plant, 
Trump's promise. There will never be a plant closure. There will never be a plant closure. And then we will film a 90-second digital ad. The guy who just lost his job. My grandpa worked there. My daddy worked there. I used to work there. Barack Obama and the Democrats saved the auto industry in the Great Recession. This president broke his promise. That's what the war room does. It's about localizing the impact of Trump. And every story is told through the lens of real Wisconsinites, um, people in Ohio and elsewhere. And that's a big part of, I think, telling the story. And boy, there's a pack of lies a mile long. And uh, people are getting it. That's why he's underwater. He's underwater in Texas. I'm, I'm not making that up. Uh, latest Quinnipiac poll, 47% of the Democrats 47% of the people polled said that they're going to vote for the Democratic candidate for president. 42% said they're going to vote for Trump. And 11% are undecided. Texas! Yes, Texas is becoming a battleground. That's why we held the debate there last night. I kid you not. I mean, we're hearing a lot about, and we're talking a lot about, farmer bankruptcies and rising suicides in Wisconsin. That's definitely something that we're talking about in Wisconsin. Are we hearing enough about that from the candidates right now? Well, the candidates are, are attempting to communicate their vision uh, for America. And, and part of the role of the party during that process is to make sure we're providing that uh, ground and air cover to, to make sure voters remember. Because the, the, the difference between now and four years ago is he now has a record. And of all the isms, and you know, we can call them this ist and that ist, and they're all accurate. But above all of that, what has been so obvious to me and so apparent now to so many voters is he's chronically ineffective. Everything he touches, he makes worse. He's made things worse for farmers. He's made things worse for people with pre-existing conditions. He's made things worse at the border. He's made things worse for women who thought Roe versus Wade was settled law. He's made things worse for immigrants. Putting kids in cages. That happened 400 years ago, too. And we shouldn't have done it then, and we should not have a sequel to that bad movie. And that's the story that we're telling through the war room, and that's what we have to continue to do as a party. That's a really important function. And we've got to do it everywhere. Uh, because one, one other thing you should know, when, when, when Tony Evers won, there's a conventional wisdom which is inaccurate. It's incomplete. That he won because, you know, we again kicked butt in Milwaukee and Madison. We did kick butt in Milwaukee and Madison. And we did much better than 2014 and 2016. We learned. But only a fourth of his margin, there was a, Scott Walker lost something like 166,000 votes from 14 to 18. And I think he won by, he lost by 29,000. He won by whatever, I, I was a lawyer because I was crappy at math, 134,000 or whatever it is. And so we have about 166,000 vote delta, the change from 14 to 18. And the thing about it is, it's a vindication of the strategy that has been put in place here in Wisconsin. Because he... He, was, he, he obviously lost Madison and um, Milwaukee, but what's more important or equally important is that across this state in smaller communities, he expanded his margin of victory in municipalities that were a thousand or less. And in every other municipality, greater than a thousand, his margin went the other way. And the bigger the municipality, the better we did. And so if you're from, uh, you know, Rhinelander or Appleton or, you know, Superior, folks, we're there and we're going to continue to be there because there are votes everywhere. We got a seventh congressional district special election. You bet your bottom dollar Ben's going to have people out there and we're going to field a great candidate, whoever that is. I don't know who it is, but it's going to be a great candidate. <laughs> and... That's the key, organizing everywhere. The data shows it works in Wisconsin for Democrats. You should feel really good about that. Did a lot better in Green Bay than we did four years earlier. We can do this because everybody across this state has a pre-existing condition in these communities. Everyone wants good education for their kids. Everyone wants to return to common decency. 
That's the thing I hate about Scott Walker. This is, Wisconsin Nice took a beating under his administration, and that's unfortunate. On, on an issue like health care, looking back to the 2018 elections, uh, Democrats were, I mean, there, there was a clear goal, there was a clear effort to block uh, the, the efforts in Congress to undo the Affordable Care Act. So there, there was a target in sight. Is it more difficult to campaign on that issue now as the party is having its own debate about public option versus Medicare for all versus what path does health care take as opposed to just blocking something that Republicans are trying no, to do? I, not at all. I mean, I, I think w the debate last night is yet another example of the values alignment that we have. Every Democrat on the stage last night wants to make sure that everyone in this country has access to quality, affordable health care. And thanks to Barack Obama, we're 85, 90% of the way up the mountaintop. Now, we have undeniable differences of opinion on how to get from where we are to the mountaintop, but we have no disagreement about the imperative of getting to the mountaintop. We have no disagreement about the fact that if you have a pre-existing condition, you should keep your coverage, like Tony Evers, for instance, a cancer survivor. There's no disagreement about the fact that the pharmaceutical industry is screwing people. And we should bring down the cost of insulin. And we can do things about that. And so I think we have a remarkable values uh, alignment. And, uh, and that's going to be up to the voters. If, if, if you believe that we should build off the Affordable Care Act and, and create the public option and do other things to uh, get us to the mountaintop, then you have two or three or four candidates who share that view. If you believe that we should use the so-called Medicare for all option, which would involve um, eliminating private insurance, then you have multiple candidates who share that vision. But again, I think the values alignment is there, and, and we won at scale in 2018 and 2017 because healthcare was indeed on the ballot, and this president has made crystal clear that they don't have a plan. They have a plan. It's to screw people and eliminate your access to health care. And it's working. Because did you see the data this week? You know, the ranks of the uninsured went up. And you don't need to be a, a health economist to figure that one out. The sabotage has had impact. And that's unconscionable. Let's talk about last night's debate a little bit, which, by the way, I mean, you, you yeah, flew there. here. Yeah, you, yeah. you flew here from Houston today, tonight. You just got here. Um, first priority when you got here was cheese curds? To, no, to go to the Union Pier and grab a burger. Okay. To to the, yeah. <laughs> Important, look, either way. My daughter had a very hard job this summer. Well, she, she worked at a, uh, some, a think tank, but then her other half of her job was she was a lifeguard at oh, the Union. What a terrible way Best to spend a day. Best tan I've ever seen her have. <laughs> So uh, perhaps even without using the phrase embarrassment of riches, I want to talk about the size of the field. Uh, last night we saw the first whittling. Uh, it was a one-night debate, a three-hour long one-night debate, which is still a lot. But uh, the, the field is uh, winnowing a little bit. The size of the debate stage is winnowing. Um, what are the, the best and worst things about the size of this field? Oh, I think it's a first-class challenge to have. I mean, we have a deep bench, and I hope you saw it last night and you saw it in June and July. Uh, I, I've had the very unique privilege, and I, I consider it a privilege of a lifetime, of having worked with just about everybody on that stage last night. And there is a remarkable alignment of values, whether it's health care, whether it's uh, climate change, whether it's uh, women's reproductive health, uh, whether it's an economy that works for everyone. Everybody understands that, uh, I mean, you see this in Wisconsin, you know, the top 1% got a third of the benefit of the tax cut. Income inequality is one of the defining issues of our time, and everybody understands that our North Star here should be shared prosperity for everyone, not prosperity for a few. And so what we did at the DNC when we had a you know, double-digit field, 24 or 25, whatever it was, was to, I understood, number one, all but one aren't going to make it to the mountaintop. Number two, I understood history, and it's imperative that the process be fair in fact and fair in perception. And so we have from the outset been exceedingly transparent. So in January, four months before the first debate, 
we announced what the thresholds would be. And we not only had a polling threshold, but we created a grassroots fundraising threshold. That's never been done before. Why did we do that? We did that for one, a, a couple of reasons. Number one, I don't think polling this early in a, a, a race is uh, a sufficient, it's, 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 it's a helpful measure, but oftentimes it measures name ID. And we wanted to give other people who might not have the national profile an alternative pathway. And I've been approached by so many people who said, wow, you know, I'm not rich, but I watched the debate and, you know, I gave so-and-so 10 bucks and I saw them on the stage and I feel invested in it. And that's what that trust building thing I mentioned before is about. And, and so we have worked very vigilantly to make sure that we were transparent, that we set bars that were fair. And the first bar was 1%, hard to get lower than 1%, I would argue. The, this one is 2% in four polls, and there were 21 polls that were eligible polls, so you had to bat four out of 21, and, and you had to have 130,000 uh, grassroots donors, and a grassroots donor can be someone who gives as little as a dollar. And so uh, nobody who's been under 2%, if you look over the last 40 years, no one who's been under 2% in the fall has ever won even a primary or caucus. And so we study history. We're not pulling these things out of whole cloth. I believe that over time, people have to demonstrate progress. I also believe that 2% is not a high bar. It's a fair bar. And uh, so we'll continue. And in November, we will uh, raise the bar uh, again because we'll be that much closer uh, to Iowa. And we will do it thoughtfully, and we will do it uh, with sufficient notice so that the candidates uh, know what they have to do. You've talked a lot about the importance of listening to the grassroots and letting them sort of drive this process, certainly more than they may have had the opportunity in 2016. Um, something that certainly I got feedback about before I sat down to talk with you, people wanted to hear about, um, and we've heard a decent amount of outcry about this, is this call for a debate focused on climate change. And I know there will be a, a forum, which is not a DNC debate. Why not go for one of those climate change debates, or why not have debates focused on any of these issues that people are calling for? Well, climate change is an existential threat. It is a hugely important issue. And, and when we were, when I first was preparing for the debate cycle, or the primary cycle, uh, one of the most remarkable revelations uh, was that in the 2016 cycle, there was virtually no discussion whatsoever on climate change. And so when I went to the networks, I said to them, we want our debates to be about issues. I don't give a damn about hand size. I want to talk about health care. I want to talk about uh, climate change. I want to talk about the existential threats, you know, income inequality, things of that nature. And you have seen last night, for me, what I loved about last night is people were getting into the weeds. We were talking about the issues that matter most. And climate is undeniably one of them. And I love the energy of the climate activists. We have, received, uh, we have received requests from somewhere between 40 and 50 organizations to have debates focused exclusively on their issue of concern. And what they all have in common is that these issues are compelling. The mothers of the movement. What do you say to a mom who buried her son after gun violence? We have a gun violence epidemic right now. You know, when you say, oh, the Aurora shooting, you got to say, well, Aurora, Illinois, or Aurora, Colorado? I mean, there's, there, if history is a guide, unfortunately, we will have another mass shooting between now and the next debate in October. I heard from Reverend Barber, who I think is one of the moral leaders of our time. He wanted us to have a debate on, focused on structural racism in this country, focused on what are we gonna do to alleviate poverty there's 140 million people living in poverty in this country, and it's getting worse in all too many places. We heard from people who are democracy activists who said, you know, you can't do climate change, you can't do minimum wage, you can't do anything if you don't reform our democracy. And the list goes on, and what all of these issues, immigration, we heard from immigrant rights activists in the height of when kids were being put in cages and they said, we should have an immigration-only debate. And what they all have in common is they're incredibly compelling. And so what we've done is we have a number of different ways in which 
we are bringing these issues to the fore. Uh, we had the first ever uh, climate um, uh, forum that CNN hosted in New York about two weeks ago. MSNBC is doing the same thing. Uh, we have had forums on a host of issues. The labor movement hosted a forum on, on, on the right to form a union. They had 17 or 18 candidates there. And so what's really important to do, and, and we've already had more discussion about climate change in the first three debates than we had in the entirety of 2016, and that is going to continue because it must. But the challenge that I had with that is I was approached by a candidate who, for whom climate change was his single issue. And he said, Tom, I know you made the rules earlier, and I know we agreed to all the rules, but I want you to hold a climate-only debate so that I can highlight the issue that is my own issue. And it seems to me that one of the lessons I took away from 2016 is if you change the rules in the middle of the game to help one candidate, well, then I got to hold an immigration-only debate when I get a call from another candidate, and then I got to hold another debate when I get a hold of another candidate. And I think our currency is to be fair to everyone, to put the rules in place, and to make sure we're doing our level best to make sure that every issue gets its uh, due. And, and I'm proud of the fact that there's going to be another climate change forum, and there's actually another one in the offing because it is a critical issue. All of these issues are existential. That's the challenge we have. We're at this moral fork in the road on so many issues. And the next president is truly gonna have to be the multitasker in chief. What do you make of the, the assessment or the discussion of, about the Democratic Party and the direction that it's going in uh, as a question of a, a choice between idealism or pragmatism or the, you know, the far left versus the moderate center? Well, I worked for a guy named Ted Kennedy, and what Ted Kennedy taught me was that idealism and pragmatism are never mutually exclusive. He said to me once, you know, Tom, if someone asks you what wing to the, of the party you belong to, tell them you belong to the accomplishments wing, because you want to get stuff done. <laughs> he used a, word, a different word that began with S, but ah. I'm going to keep it at stuff, <laughs> okay? Family friendly. And I really, I, I reject the false choice there, and I, I actually think the most interesting trend that is also the most underreported trend, is what's happening on the Republican side. The party of Lincoln has died. It's dead and buried, replaced by the party of Trump. The party of Trump is an exceedingly extreme party. Background checks are supported by like 90% of the American people. They won't do it. Help for Dreamers, supported by overwhelming, I think it's 80, 90%. They won't do it. The minimum wage has always been a bipartisan issue. They won't do it. And by the way, if you look at every red state that's had a minimum wage referendum on the ballot, and there have been like eight or nine of them, they all pass because the people are ahead of the Tea Party. You look at immigration reform, bipartisan support for immigration reform, but they won't do that. I think what's happening now is that the other side is so far to the right. And I was asked last night in the spin room by someone, isn't the party going too far left? And I said, allowing people with pre-existing conditions to keep their health care is not a radical idea. What's radical and wrong is taking away coverage from people with pre-existing conditions. What's radical and wrong is overturning Roe versus Wade. What's radical and wrong is putting people in cages, little children, and taking them away from their parents. So I'm proud of what we're doing as Democrats. Our platform is both bold and pragmatic and speaks to the issues that people care about. And it speaks to who we are as a nation. Our most enduring symbol in this country is the Statue of Liberty. It didn't say, bring me your rich, wealthy European masses. It said, bring me your tired, your huddled masses. And you look at entrepreneurship in this country. So many people who have been Fortune 500 leaders are immigrants. I know in the state of Maryland, where would we be without immigrants? Our medical profession would be a shadow of what it used to be. I know that personally because my dad was a doctor, served with distinction at a VA hospital. So when I, when I hear about is the Democratic Party going too left, the reality is the Republican Party is going too right. 
and it's unfortunate. And when I hear this socialism BS, remember the following. When Social Security was debated in the 30s, when the minimum wage was debated in the 30s, when Medicare was debated in the 60s, when the Affordable Care Act was debated, what they all had in common is the Republicans said, socialism. A guy named Ronald Reagan in 62, shilling for the AMA, said, Medicare will lead to socialized medicine. Medicare will lead to socialism in America. This is the oldest trick in the book. People understood that in 2016, 20, 2018, and they're going to get that in 2020. But we've got to make sure we're out there communicating and talking to folks and not taking them for granted. Sorry to ramble on so long, but I get a little <laughs> worked up about this. Yeah. <laughs> Since we're a little over halfway, I do want to pause. Do we have anyone out there collecting question cards? I know we said we would take questions, but I'm not sure if... Uh... Okay, um, if, if that's happening, you can bring them up anytime, and, and I'll try to work them in, and, and we'll just keep uh, talking in the meantime. Sure. Socialism. Uh, how, how do you cut through that? That is going to be the, the word that I think dominates the conversation. It, we're, we've certainly saw it even cropping up in, in 2018 elections here. It's already uh, coming up in congressional races that are going to be on the ballot in the 7th and the 5th. Well, there was a, a, a small plane flying around the arena last night uh, that said uh, socialism. I think next to it, it said there's a hurricane in Alabama, too. Uh, but uh, the... Um, I mean, the distraction of 2018 was caravans. Caravans, caravans, caravans. And the American people saw through that. Because you know why he does that? Because distracting Donald doesn't want you to focus on the real issues. He didn't want you to focus on health care. He wanted you to be distracted. And it didn't work. The distraction of 2020 will be uh, immigration again. And it will be uh, socialism. And again, you know, the, 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 actually, this, this president actually has a lot in common with some of the authoritarian socialist leaders around this world. That's sort of the irony of the kettle calling the pot black there, or whatever that saying is. I might have that backward. <laughs> but uh, again, I think this is where it gets back to a lot of the nuts and bolts. When you're organizing, when you're listening, when you are leading with your values, that's how you win, and that's how you cut through all of these distractions. I mean, he, he's a master distractor. And I, I was firmly convinced that when he fired Bolton the other day, that he was, I, I say this quite seriously, that he was doing it so that people wouldn't read about the fact that the ranks of the uninsured uh, went up. And the whole day, I, you watch the news cycle, was about Bolton's firing. And the fact that the ranks of the uninsured went up uh, was a footnote in the news cycle. And by the way, Bolton, I mean, don't cry for me, Argentina, on Bolton. <laughs> don't let the door hit you on the way out. <laughs> I mean, but I, I, again, organizing, 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 that's how we do this. Uh, <laughs> sorry about Got that. me on Bolton, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, tying this back to Wisconsin a little bit and, and going back to the, the, the pull between pragmatism and idealism, I think Wisconsin really taps into mm -hmm. what you are saying there, that Bernie Sanders, perhaps the, the epitome of the idealist candidate, candidate, won the primary here in 2016. Tony Evers, really kind of cookie-cutter pragmatist candidate, I think he, he identifies himself as such. So what does it say about Wisconsin that we have these two very different kinds of Democrats, two Democrats, or two, two folks running as Democrats, I should say, uh, who can win the state here? You know, I think elections are about um, you know, basic principles and values. And, and the alignment that everybody has on our side, uh, whether it's Tony Evers, uh, Ben Wickler, uh, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, is that you know, our North Star is making sure that everyone has a fair shake. You know, we have different uh, we, you know, we have different ideas on how to get there. But our, our North Star is fundamentally that. And, and what people want to know when they're getting ready to vote and, and getting, you know, trying to figure out who to vote for is, is this person looking out for me and people like me? You know, does this person share my values? When, when we're at DEFCON 1, 
you know, who's going to be this person's North Star? What is the singular accomplishment, in air quotes, of this administration? They would say the tax cut bill. That's a vivid illustration of who they're looking out for. They have the backs of people who look like Donald Trump. Oof, sorry. I was just reflecting on what I just said. And, <laughs> sorry. But that's what, I mean, that's, that's I think, the alignment there. And, and that is why you can have, um, that, that's why I love our field of candidates. Because that's what it's all about. You know, people, it, it, yes, there are policies and issues that people care about, but they care about something bigger. And, and everybody running for president across this spectrum, everyone who ran for governor, what we want is a Wisconsin where everyone has a fair shake. And, I mean, your failure to expand Medicaid, you know, there's 90,000 people who could have health insurance. Your effort to eliminate the Affordable Care Act, you got two and a half million people in this state with pre-existing conditions, including your governor. And so people look at that, and that's not only an issue of note, but that's a metaphor for who has my back? Who's looking out for me and people like me? And that's why I think, you, know, you look at the polling, and the top five candidates on the Democratic side, and maybe the top six, are all polling ahead of Trump. And I think the connective tissue there is that people understand that every single person on our side is looking out for them. And they're not looking out for the one percenters. So I want to talk about a question that, that has come in here from a number of people. <laughs> and I, I knew we would get here at some point, so I'm just going to jump to it now so we, so we have time for it. Gerrymandering, redistricting. Um, and yes, yes, everybody, clap for this. <laughs> uh, we're, we're getting to it. So huge statewide gains in, in 2018 in Wisconsin for Democrats, um, but the congressional not in the districts. State house. Exactly. Not, not in the state in house, the not in seats. Congress. Um, you got to beat the spread. So, so what happens yeah. next, and in particular, uh, a question for the audience is, is now that this is kind of out of the Supreme Court's hands, what can be done? Yeah, I mean, w we have to win at scale. That's what we, that's what we have to do. Uh, I know there was a lot of disappointment in that race in uh, North Carolina this week, and that was another example of you have to beat the spread. But I'll tell you, uh, Trump won that district by something like, by a double-digit margin. And uh, this time around, that was, what, 2 3%. Exact same thing happened in the 6th Congressional District of Georgia, 2017. Uh, the uh, member of Congress uh, resigned to become the HH Secretary before he got fired because he was, you know, doing something bad. And I forgot which bad thing he did because there's so many bad things being done by so many people in the cabinet, but I digress. And uh, then you go to 2018 midterm election. You know, we lost that special, and now we have Lucy McBath in the United States Congress because we made that investment. Uh, I, I headed the Civil Rights Division and I oversaw, and I sued Texas, I sued a number of states. And what your state did here was unconscionable. It was, it should have been illegal. And what we have to do when we get control of the state houses is we've gotta start using our state constitutional authority because that, unfortunately, the federal courts, you know, until we get more people on the Supreme Court, I thought that decision was absolutely wrongly decided. And the reality is right now, uh, we have to win more elections and we have to use the tools we have. And let me give you an example. Just a week ago, roughly, in, Wisconsin, in uh, North Carolina, a state case was filed under the state constitution. And by the way, we invested in the Supreme Court elections in that state. And my former colleague at the Justice Department, we worked together in the Clinton administration. She's the first African-American woman on the state Supreme Court of North Carolina. And they won the case at the trial level. And now because we have control of the Supreme Court there in North Carolina, we are, they didn't even appeal. So we're gonna get fair maps in North Carolina. Now I know, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm intimately familiar with the Dallas race and then with the race a year later. And um, we were all disappointed in that. We've got to learn from it. But I think we've got to continue to fight, continue to win, to, to we, we've, I mean, we just, 
I wish I could give you a better answer here in Wisconsin, but I don't want to give you false hope in the Supreme Court. They, have, they had two opportunities. And, and Don Verrilli, who, with whom I worked at the Justice Department, who argued uh, a number of these cases, I was speaking with him regularly, and uh, you know, he said if it, if it ends up the way we think it will end up, it, it does, in the short term, foreclose opportunities. But that's why building the voter protection infrastructure is so important. We still see challenges in the state of Wisconsin with African-American voters in terms of participation. And I firmly believe that part of the challenge there is your voter ID law. And so we've got to continue our work in that area. We have to make sure that we have a 12-month-a-year voter protection infrastructure. Because what we did wrong as a party was it was a sprint. You know, we won a voter purge case in North Carolina in 2016. We won it a week before the presidential. We won the battle and we lost the war because we couldn't find the voters. So that's what we have to do now. I wish I could give you a better answer to that question. And I speak to you as someone who spent a lot of time in this foxhole. Uh, but once we lost that Merrick Garland seat, uh, once that seat was stolen, uh, I knew we were going to be in trouble on this issue, on union organizing, and on a whole wide range of issues that I think a lot of y'all care about. Something that struck me watching last night's debate um, that almost, I guess, struck me because it wasn't striking is the diversity on stage, gender, uh, ethnicity, sexual orientation. It is a diverse field of candidates, unlike anything we've seen before. And that's exciting. Uh, but what is the party doing to make sure that these gains don't stall here? Well, I worked, again, as I said, I've worked for Ted Kennedy. I spent most of my career doing civil rights work. Civil rights is the unfinished business of America. And, you know, we have to continue these efforts. And I, I, that's why I felt an immense sense of pride last night. The, the last question that George asked, which was a, a by design open-ended question to allow people to, you know, give people a window into their uh, soul. And that's what voters want to see. I mean, I mean, Pete's answer was compelling. So many answers on that stage were compelling. And I think what we have to do is continue. I mean, the other side wants to take us, make America great again is really a metaphor for make America white again. And that's just not where we are. And, and that is why we have to make sure that their linchpin for their success is our people not showing up. And by our people, I'm not just talking about our communities of color. I'm talking about people who care about an America that works for everyone. People who understand that our diversity is our greatest strength. We were the diversity in my neighborhood growing up. My dad spoke Ricky Ricardo English. We were welcomed in our neighborhood. That's what America is about. That's what Wisconsin is about. And I think the way we answer your question is to make sure that we're electing Democrats who understand that our diversity is indeed our greatest strength and who then appoint people who reflect that diversity. And when we do that, I think that's how we will win. And I, I think the arc of the moral universe is going to continue to bend toward justice, but only if we are electing more Democrats. I hate to be so partisan, but that <laughs> is the damn truth. <laughs> Well, it's your job a little bit to be so partisan. <laughs> How has the, the job of a party chair changed in the last couple decades as the parties themselves have really become more homogenous, but the gulf between parties is probably wider than it's ever been before. Do you think that the, the job that you hold is, is different now from others before you? Well, I think I, I'm hearing two different questions yeah, there. Yeah. And um, the job of party chair has evolved because the way campaigns are financed and the Citizens United and all of that has evolved. And so you have the so-called soft side and the hard side and you have all this dark money. And uh, what, what is so important for a DNC chair or a Wisconsin party chair is, uh, and, and this is what I love about Ben because Ben is remarkably humble. And I really believe we, we were about culture change. And a big part of the culture change we were trying to do is we want to be a tent pole in a broader ecosystem. The most successful party chairs are the party chairs 
who have built a strong infrastructure within the party, but have built strong relationships with our key partners in labor, our key partners in faith communities, our key partners uh, in the women's community, our, our key emerging partners, our key legacy partners. That is so critically important. And, and then understanding the rules of engagement and, and, and getting right up to the foul line. I still coach basketball. I, you, know, you don't shoot free throws from the top of the key. So you, well, Chamberlain did actually, um, but that, he had a really crappy percentage of makes. Um, but uh, understanding what the rules are, so that's evolved in that way. I mean, the difference between the Democrats and the Republicans right now, I mean, the party of Lincoln is dead. I, I mean, I, you know, I thought Mitt Romney was, you know, supposed to be sort of a compassionate conservative. Um, I don't know what, I, I mean, Rana, I, I, God bless him. You know, I mean, because you are, they just canceled all their, they're canceling their primaries. You know, that, that's an, what a wonderful act of democracy. Uh, cancel the primaries because the authoritarian leader, um, did you, there was a, their latest meme is uh, Trump 2024. You know, hey, let's do that too. I mean, the party of Trump, I, I can't even begin uh, to say, uh, I mean, one, one of the people who is a good friend of mine is Michael Steele who's the former head of the RNC, a Marylander. And, uh, and we have profound differences of opinion on issues of importance, but we have a, a really um, good friendship. And we've done panels together in a number of places. And the party has left him. I mean, he doesn't have, he couldn't answer that question either uh, because they frankly uh, kicked him out because uh, he was trying to do things that were anathema to what their current, core values are. Going back to the last Democratic president we did have, you were part of the Obama administration. Uh, two of the candidates running right now, do we have more? Several of the candidates running right now served under uh, President Obama. Uh, we've heard, I think, a lot of litigation of what the Obama legacy is, whether it's on health care, whether it's on immigration, um, and any number of issues, and sometimes candidates want to embrace it, sometimes they want to distan distance themselves from it. What do you think uh, the Obama legacy is and, and how ought to or ought not to a candidate carry that forward in, in the next Democratic administration? I think Barack Obama will go down as one of the most impactful presidents in American history, period. And uh, inherited the worst economic mess of our lifetime. The question presented was, were we gonna have a great recession or were we gonna have a great depression? Two wars. Um, a guy named McConnell who said, I want to make him a one-term president. That's not who we are. That's not who we should be, especially in that moment. But that's what he inherited. You know how many presidents tried to do what he did with the Affordable Care Act? I mean, Richard Nixon tried. So Republicans and Democrats tried. Ted Kennedy, health care was, in his words, the cause of his lifetime. I mean, this stuff was hard, and he got it done. And if he were here tonight, he would talk with pride and understandably about that great legacy. And he would also say, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union, it's a timeless journey, and we are building off of that legacy. And I am damn proud of the work we did there. Uh, and I think what people miss as much as anything is sanity in the White House. I mean, it really, I mean, if, if, if my children lied one one hundredth of as frequently as this president would lie, there would be consequences. Um, what the American people miss is, you know, Canada is our friend. Russia is not. You know, like the basics, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, a, a person who you may disagree with, but you know that his, mo his North Star is pointed in the right direction. And so, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, if you're running for president, I, I think you, you know, I, I would, uh, I, I think he's a remarkable president. And I think uh, we, we want to build off of that and, um, and move forward. We're nearing the end of our time, so I'm going to ask you a really left-field one from the audience. When will you run for president? 
Never. Next question. Never? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I know you've declined to answer this in other states, but I know Wisconsin's very special. So who's your favorite candidate? <laughs> let me put my button out. <laughs> Democrat for president. I mean, I, let me say this about that question. I, I suspect if we did a very informal poll that a number of candidates would get, uh, would get votes from this room. And what I would encourage you to do, and the reason we've tried to present this debate process you know, in a really... Um, inclusive way is because I've worked with just about all of them and I think they're all spectacular and it's up to you and so I really encourage you to date early and date often and dates you know simultaneously <laughs> because I think you will in all seriousness I think you will really um, grow fond of more than one person at the same time and unlike other contexts in your life where that would be problematic <laughs> This is not, but what I would say is truly um, imperative, in all seriousness, is uh, you know, all but one aren't gonna make it to the mountaintop. And if we want to govern, we must first win. And so you may agree with someone 70 or 80% of the time, but if we allow the perfect to be the enemy of the very, very good, well then we will repeat the mistakes of history. We have worked our tails off to make sure that everybody understands that. And we've worked our tails off to make sure that we are earning the trust of, of young voters, of every voter. Because, folks, this, we can withstand four years of this president. We are a resilient nation. But I'm not sure about eight. I'm really not. And that is why everybody's got to get out there. You know, we've got, I said at the outset, we got 418 days till the weekend. And uh, every single day, I tell you what my outcome measure is, 100% of my time was spent on moving forward so that we could defeat Donald Trump, not moving sideways. There, are, there will be days where, oh, I'm angry at this candidate, I'm angry at that candidate. But you know what, at the end of the day, if you're angry at one of us or you're angry at me, I ask you to think of the following, and I mean this quite seriously. Think about the woman or man that you know that's about to lose their health care. I think about this Honduran 11 year old boy that I met when I was in Arizona working with some faith leaders recently. He and his dad just came here after a four month journey. And I think about the unspeakable challenges that they've had. He's had to grow up really fast. I think about those dreamers. Did you, I don't know if you saw earlier this week you got dreamers with serious health conditions who've been told you got to go back to your home country. Don't know if you saw that. I mean, like, where is your heart, Mr. President? Think about all them. Because we cannot afford to be distracted between now and 418 days from now. We must be singularly focused. And I hope you will um, seek out Ben Wickler after tonight because he is doing a bang-up job. I hope you will seek out the DNC after tonight, because we'd love to have you volunteer at the convention, and we'd love to have you continue that work, because for me, this is about my kids and my kids' generation. This is a where were you moment. Yeah, I've seen Hamilton five times, <laughs> and uh, I will not sing, because I'm terrible at it. But history does have its eyes on us, that was one of those songs. It really does. And, uh, you know, this ain't the first time we've been in, in the ditch. You know, we had the Know Nothing movement. We've, we've had the Chinese Exclusion Act. We've had the internment of Japanese Americans. We've had the McCarthy era. And what all those eras had in common, and will have in common with this era, is they all came to an end. And they came to an end for one simple reason. And that is the most important word in a democracy, Barack Obama said, when I had the privilege of going to Selma to mark the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. The most, the most important word in a democracy is that simple two-letter word, we. It was we the people that have enabled us to do so many things in this country and to respond to some of these dark forces. And it's we the people again that'll do it. But the we the people this time is you. It's me. It's all of us. That's why I ran for this, because I couldn't live with myself if I had just been a spectator. 
this president has taught us that democracy can't be a spectator sport. And so I hope you'll all stay engaged. And I hope you'll engage like never before. Because I will say this, the other side is motivated too. So they're coming out. And we've got to come out too. The, most, the, the state that gets the most articles written about it right now in terms of battlegrounds is the state we are currently sitting in. So this is truly a ground zero. And it may prove to be the ground zero. And I look at that, if I were a Wisconsin resident, as a tremendous opportunity to be able to ask and answer that where were you question. Because you'll be able to tell your kids and grandkids that I was in the front lines of ground zero when we took back our democracy in November of 2020. I really need your help. Ben really needs your help. America really needs your help. And the world is crying out for our help. Well, we're gonna wrap it up in just a second here, but I have a little tradition with uh, a lot of the interviews that I do here, and I've put Great. Ben through this too, so you can stack your measures up against him later. Uh-oh. I need to know your favorite Wisconsin beer and your favorite Wisconsin cheese. Oh, wow. Well, I've been having, I'm an IPA guy, so I, by the way, my wife just gave me a t-shirt that says, drink Wisconsinably. <laughs> <laughs> that I like that. So it's a red T-shirt. Got it in Milwaukee. It was very, very nice. I do like Spotted Cow simply because you can only get it here, uh, and you can't get it at home. Yeah. But uh, I, um, I like any IPA that uh, we can get here. All right. Got a cheese? Oh, uh, absolutely. That would be a cheddar. <laughs> Although when I was first coming here, we used to have a lot of that Merck's until I... Uh, the spread, that's the spread. The, that's the spread. Yeah. Until I, my palate got a little more sophisticated <laughs> after that. Because I don't know what the term cheese food means. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's when I realized I, 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 I need to adjust. <laughs> Everyone, can we give uh, Tom Perez a huge round of applause? Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Great. Appreciate your help. <laughs>